I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we've been running these live Zoom uh, presentations free on Thursdays. We've been doing them both at 12 and when possible at 7 p.m. as well. So people can come during lunch break or after they're done working or homeschooling for the day. Um, it looks like we're going to keep going in May with them. So we hope to release the lineup early next week. And you can find that lineup at www.montclairhistory.org. Um, check, I would say, by next Tuesday, and we should have it up and, and um, announced. Um, finally, before we move into this, I'd like to invite you to support the Montclair History Center um, in whatever way you can. Like all small businesses, we are, and nonprofits, we're doing whatever we can to stay afloat, bring you history, and every little bit helps. I'm just going to share a screen for but a moment, um, because there are several ways that you can do it. Um, you can do it on our website. We have a join or donate button. You can become a member or you can just give a one-time uh, donation. That's www.monclairhistory backslash donate. We're also on Venmo um, and it's at Jane Dash Eliasoff. And yes, it really goes to the Montclair History Center and not me on that, um, even though my name is on there. Or you could do it the old fashioned way and just send us a check, 108 Orange Road. Um, that's our offices, and I stop in about once a week and um, gather any checks and mail and bills and other exciting things, and um, I will collect it that way. So now I'd like to introduce, um, uh, before I do, I just want to, before I introduce Helen, I just want to acknowledge a couple of our other board members that are on. We have Mike Farrelly, uh, Mike Wave, Mike Wave, there we go, Mike Farrelly, who is a um, board member and our town historian. We have Deborah David on, who is a board member. And um, let me just see if there's anybody hiding on page two. Liz Hines, who's the president of our board, she's on. I believe Kathleen is on, Kathleen Powers. She is a member of our board and um, looks like she's hiding without her video, as is one of our staff members, Erin Benz. And that looks like about it. So. Helen is also one of our board members and she's our presenter. She's a trustee um, and has done extensive research on many, many parts of Montclair and actually leads our hometown history bus tour among other things. Um, Helen lives right near Mills Reservation. So if you were on a little bit earlier, you, can, you learned that she walks her dogs there and is intimately familiar with it. Um, She's dug into how it became a reservation, as well as some of the oddities that you might come across while you're doing it. And Helen also does a tremendous amount of work, not just behind the scene and behind the screen, but also um, in other ways as well. And so Helen, thank you for everything you do. And I turn it over to you. Um, first, I wanted to ask um, how many people routinely uh, go up to Mills? Can you, with a show of hands, um, if you can just wave your hand. Okay. And if you haven't been to Mills, hopefully this presentation will in inspire you to do so. And if you're in my family, I promise I'll take you there sometime uh, when you come and visit me. So I know everyone just really wants to get right to it. So what is that cement pad up there at Mills? It's the reason that most of you are, are here today, right? Well, we're not going to talk about that now. We're not going to talk about that just yet. We're going to cover that a little later. I'm going to talk about a lot of other little parts of um, uh, the Mills history. Uh, first, I just want to cover some basics of uh, facts and figures about um, Mills that we know today. It's um, and I so I've identified the uh, road surrounding it. I put the reservoir in there so you get a sense, you get your bearings. It is, um, it's a 157 acre reservation. All but two of it is in Cedar Grove. Claire loves to just claim it as our own. Um, it began with a 118 uh, <coughs> donation from the Devella Mills Foundation in 1954. And then there were some additional land swaps and acquisitions that brought it up to its current size. And it's really just always been such a mystery how this this wasn't covered with housing, um, you know, so a lot of the, the rest of the mountaintop is covered with housing. So how are we so lucky, and thank goodness we are, that it wasn't covered um, with housing. Um, first, let's look at, cover some of the geography. Um, and actually, I think some of this came up on Growing Up in Montclair page or something this just this morning. But um, 
Mill sits on top of a mountain. It's not a big mountain, but it's a real mountain. Um, it's about uh, 400 to 500 feet. It's the, uh, it's called First Mountain. It's the first most easternmost ridge of the Wachung mountain chains. Um, oh, and you can see uh, sort of roughly get a sense of, um, you know, how that works. And Cedar Grove is on top of Second Mountain, which is, you know, behind us. So Montclair's along the eastern slope of First Mountain and um, Cedar Grove is along the western slope of, of um, First Mountain. And uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, advantages to being here on top of the mountain. Um, you get the New York City views. When we read in the literature from the 1800s, when people really started moving out here, they came here for the healthy air, the mountain air. We know they, they built tuberculosis hospitals on top of uh, the second mountain in Cedar Grove. We know what prime real estate it is on top of First Mountain. And there's a lot of raw materials from the quarries that were all along the ridge. We know about the, the bird watching that happens here, especially on First Mountain, because it's got a very unique position. You can learn. Um, and, um, and also, apparently, according to um, Phil Jaeger in his book, um, he mentions that um, the mountain also makes the temperature in Montclair a couple de degrees uh, warmer than in Cedar Grove because um, I guess we get the, there's something about the, uh, the warmer ocean air is contained on our side of the mountain and Cedar Grove is just a little chillier. Um, I wanted to uh, go over some maps because we all love to dig into these maps. So the earliest map I have is from 1901 and, and the reservoir wasn't there yet, but I just put it in there so you can get your bearings. Um, so this is about 1900 and you can see that, um, let me see if I can make my cursor. Yeah, here. So this is Normal Avenue. Um, and it was called Fifth Avenue at that time. And so the reservoir was not there. Um, it went all the way to Ridge Road. Today, if somebody said, meet me at the corner of Ridge Road and Normal Avenue, they'd essentially be telling you to jump in the lake because that is uh, a reservoir now. And here we jump to, oh, so those are just some, some points. Um, Newark purchased the land for the reservoir in 1899. And the, the reservoir began operations in 1905, so you'll see it here on this 1906 map. Um, so now you can get a sense of some of the familiar names, the landowners that we see here. Um, Selyu is a big name in Montclair. Spear certainly is a big name in this area of Montclair. This was Spear Town, this section of Montclair. Um, Van Riper, another big name. And, um, and then let's see who do we have over here. Osborne from Osborne and Marcellus, they ran the quarry. Um, so you can see, you know, that things are starting to take shape. And this, all this land over here is owned by the city of Newark, all the blue for their reservoir. Um, but as, as early as um, actually 1896, there's some uh, articles and other materials that indicate that people have wanted to preserve this mountaintop. So this is a map from 1915 that I'll talk about in a second, but in 1896, there was a New York Times article that was urging the Essex County Park Commission to create um, a, a mountain park from Eagle Rock all the way, um, they wanted to create picturesque breathing spots from Eagle Rock as far as Van Geisen's Gap, which is today's Bradford Avenue, um, at least. So, you know, someone was already envisioning of pre preserving all this space. And then in 1909, John Noland, um, the landscape planner who was doing a lot of work in a lot of Essex County towns at that time to help towns who were growing exponentially, like we were, experienced smart growth and, you know, sort of beautiful growth. Um, he was encouraging um, some circuit drives to take advantage of beautiful pathways and beautiful scenery. Uh, this particular map is from 1915 and the Olmsted firm developed it and, and it's hard to read but you can see like some the darker um, the darker sections are there's a, a connection between different parks along the mountaintop. So um, you can grasp that people have been I were eyeing this, the importance of preserving the mountaintop for a long time. And then in 1931, from the Essex County Park Commission minutes, um, I found this note that um, there was a petition from citizens of Montclair and Cedar Grove asking that the mountaintop be preserved for botanists and 
nature walker or nature lovers and geologists and all that. So behind the scenes, even though the property was owned by um, a lot of different landowners, uh, people were looking for a way to make it accessible to the public. Here's the 1933 map. So the difference from 1906 to 1933 is there's fewer landowners. So you can see, um, this, so the city of Newark still owns this. Um, this is now um, the estate of Timothy Selyu. And there's a realty company in here somewhere. Um, sorry, I, this is showing up on my second screen over here. That's why I lean over. Here, this property is owned by the Episcopal Diocese of Newark. And um, I was, I uh, was fortunate to meet um, a woman, Nancy Knertzer, some of you may know her. She lived, her family had been in Montclair since the late 1800s and lived along Highland Avenue for a long time. And, and she remembers, as she grew up in Highland Avenue, that um, she had been told that the Episcopal Diocese of Newark was thinking about building a retreat here. Um, so, um, Oh, Tremont Realty, that's the other name I wanted to point out to you. So this was, in 1933, Montclair was sort of at the end of a huge building boom. And um, we were, this was the most northern section of town. It was sort of the last section to be developed. Um, now let's zoom back out and look at sort of the larger context of what was happening um, just in the area, in the region. You can see from this graphic that Adam Grace developed for me the exponential population growth that Montclair experienced with the arrival of the trains. Um, and um, let's see. So the train spurred this tremendous growth because now people could commute daily from um, to New York or to Newark and they could live on this beautiful mountain. Um, the first train to Montclair came in 1856 to Lackawanna Plaza and then the second train line that went from Walnut Street all the way up to Montclair Heights in uh, 1873, and Montclair Heights being very close to Mills. And Cedar Grove also had a train line in 1891. So our population just exploded from five, about 5,000 in 1880 to 42,000 in 1930, and that's more than we have today. We have um, 39,000 today. So, you know, farms were being, um, de were being developed and uh, we were sprawling and becoming, uh, you know, people were moving in. Um, so the trains made the commute possible, but let me remind you why people were seeking this location. So this is a scene from New York City, you know, in comparison to the, our mountains, our mountainside, um, you know, people were coming from New York where it was crowded and dirty and noisy um, in different parts. So people like this, the Moore family, um, this is a picture from 1904. They were a typical family that had moved to Montclair. The father was, um, this is Mrs. Henry Moore, and her husband, Henry, was an insurance executive. And here she is with um, little Tom and Margaret at the Upper Montclair train station. And maybe they're going in to meet dad for lunch or grandma for shopping or something. Um, and also people like Benjamin Moore lived in town about that time. Um, he came from Brooklyn. Uh, he started the paint company in Brooklyn, but he lived in Montclair for some time. And um, many people moved here from Manhattan, Brooklyn, um, Hoboken, Newark. And um, yeah, that Brooklyn to Montclair uh, route was well established by the 1800s. So also at this time, there were sort of professional planners were weighing in and they were seeing that this exponential growth was not going to stop. This is um, from an article in the Montclair Times in, 1960, in 1932 projecting that um, Montclair's population would rise not, um, you know, not just to, uh, you know, about 30,000, which it was, or um, 40,000 back then, but it would go all the way up to 100,000 by 1965. And um, some of the things, and, you know, this was a legitimate planning professional who was proposing, um, you know, who was, these, was making these predictions. And some of the other things he predicted never um, came to be. They did electrify the Erie, but probably, um, let's see, 70 years after he predicted it. But, um, but so this was some of the thinking that was happening um, around the same, around um, in the 1930s as we were growing exponentially. Now we're gonna go back to the mountaintop. So um, with, with this vision of exponential growth, um, you know, keep that in mind. And remember this 1933 map, and I want to talk to you about, um, I had pointed out the Episcopal Diocese of Newark property here. And, and I had heard uh, that, and residents had heard that maybe the diocese was planning a retreat there. 
on that is at about 40 acres. So um, what I was really astonished to see in the files, and I think many people who learn this are surprised to learn that it wasn't a retreat. It was, there were plans for a cathedral and guess where, in Mills. Um, so um, why were they, why was the Episcopal Diocese um, looking to Mills to build a cathedral site? Um, they were located in Newark, but they were landlocked. Um, and so, and they were hearing these projections that a lot of their um, parishioners and, um, you know, wealthy parishioners at, at, were moving to western parts of Essex County. So they were sort of looking to the future for a more suitable, convenient site. Um, and so in 1931, um, they purchased 40 acres of property. They held it till about 1952. And um, let's see, I just want to make sure that I'm getting everything here. Um, and here's so some documentation that I was lucky enough to find. The diocese was very generous and let me look through their files. So these are some of the tracks that they bought from. And there's, you know, Sigler, Van Riper, those are some big names in, in this um, part of Upper Montclair. And then I even found some pictures, which was really amazing. I might have even been jumping up and down. Jane was with me that day. I, um, I, she was doing research on something else there at the diocese. And um, when we found the pictures, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty neat because I don't think anybody had seen these pictures in, you know, I don't, over 70 years. So <laughs> it was pretty exciting. So this is a, um, an undated photo, but of Normal Avenue looking east toward Upper Mountain. And um, you can see what the sign says is, um, it says Cathedral Grounds of the Episcopal Church Diocese of Newark. So it wasn't, uh, you know, I mean, it went this far that they were already, they had uh, signs up and they were announcing that this was the site. Here it is looking in the other direction, looking toward, looking west. And um, and also just notice how small the trees are. Sometimes people ask about the trees. So this mills, what the mills we see today is not any kind of old growth forest. The trees had probably been cleared any number of times up to this point in the 30s, you know, because people owned property up there, um, they cleared it to farm it, um, they cleared it for firewood, for building materials, but so I'm just pointing out, look at how little the trees are compared to what we see today. Um, so there were no, um, it doesn't appear that the plans, uh, there were no designs for a cathedral. Um, oh, hang on one second. Um, this is another um, picture of a, a baptism taking place in the woods, and this was from the Episcopal Diocese's uh, own newsletter in 1932. So they were definitely set on, on, on doing this. Um, and like I said, there, were, there are no designs for what might have happened there, but there were a couple letters of introduction in the files. One was from the pastor of the Grace Church in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, and he was recommending this architect, Frank Hutton, who had just recently finished the Paris House parish house um, for his church. So he was highly recommending um, Frank Hutton be considered. And this is um, just an example of Frank Hutton's work. There was, uh, there were a couple other letters from architects who had heard that a commission might be coming up. So it was clearly announced and was publicly known that they were planning on a cathedral. And so we'll, we don't know what it might have looked like, but cathedrals aren't usually very small. So on the left, we have St. John the Divine in New York, and on the right is another cathedral, Episcopal um, cathedral in Long Island. So I think it's probably safe to say that it was going to be a large complex um, on those 40 acres, but it never came to be. Um, so this is the Episcopal, um, um, this is the cathedral today. It's still in Newark on Broad Street. It's called the Trinity and St. Philip's Cathedral. And um, so ultimately the, the diocese decided to stay and they named the historic Trinity Church their cathedral. The tower of that church, and this is a tremendously historic building, and the tower is really all that remains of the original that has, it's been around since um, Revolutionary War days, and it was, it, it had been pretty beat up over the years. It had been used, I think, as a hospital during the Revolutionary War, so it has seen some, um, you know, it has seen some history. But um, so in May of 1944, Trinity merged with the cathedral chapter, um, and and that and they decided definitively to stay in Newark. And, and just one last interesting note about this cathedral: in 1966, Trinity Parish and Trinity's Black Mission Church merged. Um, St. Philip's, so that's why it's called 
Trinity and St. Philip's Cathedral. Um, it was very progressive in 1966 for um, the African American church and the traditionally white church to merge um, in, in a time of great um, racial unrest. But um, so anyways, that is the current cathedral there in Newark on Broad Street, um, Trinity and St. Philip's. So that was, was what was almost up at Mills. So how did we get Mills? Um, let's meet the Mills for whom the, the site is named. Here's David, there's Ella, and this is the spark plug that made them millions of dollars. Um, so David invented the Raha spark plug and he sold it to GM and he, um, and he had lots of GM stock. Um, they were very philanthropic. They lived on Upper Mountain Avenue in Montclair. Um, they um, helped fund the Mountainside, uh, the nursing school at Mountainside Hospital, which was in the last few years demolished and replaced with a medical office building. Uh, they built the Social Agencies Building on South Fullerton, and if you look up above the door, it says the Mills Building. They also contributed to many other, some a church in Cedar Grove and um, many other things. Uh, when, when Ella died in 1931, they placed half their fortune into the Devella Mills Foundation. And then the remainder of uh, David's fortune was bequeathed at his death in 1944 to the Develop Mills Foundation with the instructions that it should be liquidated um, 11 years after his death. So in the focus uh, was stated to be for religious, charitable, scientific, and educational purposes. So they had lots, lots of options there. They gave away, the foundation gave away $10 million in 24 U.S. cities and 12 foreign countries. He was actually Canadian, so there was um, some stuff in Canada too. And in 1935, their fund was um, worth about 1.6 million, but by the time, um, by the, time it, the fund was depleted, uh, well, the value had risen to $3 million. And there was this funny article in the New York Times about how the, um, the trustees were a little grump <clears throat> excuse me, grumpy about having to give away so much money because it was suddenly, it was a bigger job than they had signed on for. But um, they managed to do it. And um, a lot of a lot of people benefited from it. A, a recap of what they did there, and so now here's the evolution of the design of mills. So um, so they bought these plots of land. These are the plots that they bought. Um, this is a 1954 sort of survey map, and. Um, they were trying to decide, should they give it to the Essex County, Essex County Park Commission or to the Township of Montclair? If it was given to the Township of Montclair, um, it would have been under the auspices of the Citizens Committee of the Presby Iris Gardens, because, you know, it kind of ties in with, you know, the Iris Gardens are right below the, um, one of the entrances to Mills. But the, the citizens of Cedar Grove actually um, objected and asked the foundation to give it to the Essex County Park System because the residents of Cedar Grove said they weren't they weren't always made to feel welcome when they went to um, when they came to the parks in Montclair. So um, I guess they were convincing, and it went to the the donation went to the Essex County Park Commission. Uh, the Essex County consulted Olmstead. Olmstead said, "Don't even bother to take it unless you can also get the reservoir in with the deal." which they didn't, but um, Essex P County Park System um, ignored Olmstead's advice, um, took the 118 acres, then they hired Olmstead to, to do the design. This is a, so there were lots of studies um, done about mills. And um, so Olmstead's designed like everything, Anderson Park, Brookdale Park, um, Glenfield Park, I mean, all over, all over New Jersey, all over the place. Um, the Olmsted firm. So they had lots of plans, templates for uh, a, a plot of land this large. And I, in, in these plans, they're kind of shocking to see how they are not what Mills looks like today, but they probably were, um, you know, things, they were pulling out elements that they'd successfully used in other designs and they were toying with this. Now, I also heard from Nancy Knertzer again that she recalls her father um, attending community meetings where they asked for community input. So did people want something formal like a Brookdale Park or did they want something more, um, more naturalized? So, but, so let's look at this 1958 study. Um, I'm gonna, it's hard to read, but I'm gonna I'm blow up some sections. So here's Normal Avenue, a hundred car parking lot. Um, Edgecliff Road, another hundred car parking lot. Reservoir Road, another hundred car parking lot. And you can see so there's a long driveway to get to, to uh, Reservoir Road. Um, 
and then they had two scenic overlooks. And of course, there are scenic overlooks at Mills, but nothing is official is what this design would suggest. There were stables. Um, and so this is the same map, and I'm just highlighting these areas, which are now part of Mills in 1958, weren't part of Mills. They weren't, this was the original donation. Um, it would take some time uh, to get this land. So for example, this land right near um, Reservoir Road and Ridge Road, it belonged, so here's the reservoir, the city of Newark Water Authority owned it or whatever. Um, so they swapped land. The um, Essex County Park System owned some land in Newark they, it, that ultimately the city of Newark built Behringer High School on and the park system got this little piece of land right next to um, the reservoir. And so with a swap like that and other small acquisitions, that's how we ended up with 118, 157 acres. Here's a 1961 plan, again, just showing like things that are crazy when you think about what Mills looks like today. So this is Ridge Road and here's Reservoir Road and there's, you know, they have um, a shelter, a children's playground. Um, here's the, another, the normal avenue entrance with a gazillion parking spots. Um, and Notice this little area here, this gate. I'm going to talk about that later. This is the entrance that we know to go into Mills today. Another 1963 plan, they're talking about softball diamonds and playgrounds, which they called corrals, but there was really a playground and administrative office buildings. <clears throat> um, but I think fortunately, the final design was quite undeveloped, which um, seems to be what the neighbors preferred. And it may have been a you know, just a money thing or whatever. But so I think we're fortunate that it wasn't developed into any of those things on those preliminary plans. Um, I'm gonna go over a couple of the little uh, weird mysteries or whatever of Mills now. So first that house on the corner, um, they just never sold their land. Um, it's not any more mysterious than that. Um, it was owned by the Chalmers family and they never sold it. And so Mills was built around it. This is a nice picture that on the left um, was from the, the Newark Public, Public Library archives. The, um, um, the archivist for Essex County Parks Commission, Kathy Poole, actually sent it to me when she came upon it one day because she knew I did a lot of research down at the Essex County Park Commission and she was a tremendous help. Um, and when she saw this picture, she knew I would like it. So you can imagine looking at the picture on the left, you know, plodding along in your horse and buggy on some scenic drive that one of those guys in 1896 or 1905 or whatever was saying, wouldn't this be nice to, to you know, like clomp around all over Essex County on top of the mountain. So you can see the little horse and buggy and this nice road and the reservoir would be over here and here's Mills. And then on the right is a picture today where, you know, if you drive on uh, on this road, you know, the people go like a thousand miles an hour. It's like the Indy 500 going all around the curve. Um, and now I want to talk about the quarry. Obviously, it has a big uh, impact on mills. So this circle, um, well, here, I'm going to have to use my pointer to point out where we are. So this is Brandford Avenue. That's a typo um, in the 1906 map. This is Bradford Avenue. It used to be Van Geijen's Gap. And remember one of those early New York Times articles was saying, you know, build the park all the way to Van Geisen Gap or further. So they're finally getting around to it um, in the 1950s. But so here's Bradford. So here's Upper Mountain, go up Bradford Avenue and turn into Highland. And Highland only goes a few houses in. This big area is the Osborne and Marcellus Quarry. Um, the quarry was, um, was active and they were, well here, let me just do my whole demonstration. What were they mining in the quarry? They were mining brownstone, which is the builder's name for sandstone. And oops, here we go. This is um, trap rock. Does this look familiar? Have you tripped over these in mills? Um, this is the builder's name for basalt, a really tough igneous rock. Um, and this has, I don't think here, well, it has a lot of iron in it. That's why you can see some little red um, rusty streaks in it. If you, some of our oldest buildings in town would have, would be made of um, sandstone and of the basalt. But so the rocks were really big business um, back in the day. This quarry, oh, let me go to the next. 
Um, this is Winter Maxellus Quarry. Oh, yeah. Helen, somebody pointed out that on the map just before you can see Benjamin Moore's property on that map. Ah, okay, yes. Um, where are we? Here he is. Where is he? Here's Bradford. Here's Benjamin Moore's house. Um, and this, there's now a house here, a more modern house here right on the corner, but the next house in, it's a stucco. Um, is that needs a paint job. Needs a paint job, right. He did not build the house, by the way, but, um, uh, but he lived there for some time. He, Benjamin Moore was uh, like the financial angel for the Commonwealth Club. He was a member of the, that men's club and they were having some real tough times and he saved them. But anyways, yes, good, good eyes. Yep, that's Benjamin Moore's house. So back to the quarry. So, so you're, if you're at Mills at the concrete pad, you're basically looking over this cliff. And so this is where the quarry was. Um, and what, and so here you can see there's like horses. I have another picture that's uh, another good picture I'll show you too. This was an ad from an old city directory showing the crusher. Um, so they put the rocks in there and they'd crush them for gravel because they needed a lot of gravel for the railroads, for the streets, um, or they would leave them in big blocks for building. And so, um, um, and so the quarry relied on steam power at this point within the horse and buggy days to, to break up the rock. Um, so they would either take the broke the rock to their to their yard on Bellevue Avenue behind the theater, or they would take it right to a building site. And so when the quarry ceased operations, that's when Highland Avenue w went all the way through, and some other roads like Edgecliff Road and stuff were extended. And so many of our oldest buildings, like I said, in town were were built, and you know it was kind of hard to. Um, drag these rocks very far. So uh, I like to use the example of the church on the corner of Valley and um, and Mount Hebron Road. The, it was formerly, it was built at the Mockler Heights Reform Church. It has a different name now, but um, it has trap rock. If you go up too close to it, you can see the rusty streaks in the, in the, in the trap rock. Um, St. James is also has that. And um, you know, you can see some of the oldest homes in Montclair have the sandstone foundation rocks. Whoopsie. Let me just hang up on that. Um, okay. And this is um this is a uh, geologic survey map that just shows how the whole this is first mountain. The, you know, we this wasn't the only quarry. This was the one um, the Osborne and Marcellus, but there were more quarries going this way. There were more quarries going up towards Montclair State. Half of what's Montclair State now was a quarry. Um, so this was first mountain and presumably second mountain were uh, rich in materials that were mined um, for for building. Um, okay, and this map just gives you a sense of um, so this is a 1976 map, but this is a uh, topographic map map. So the lines they're very close together here. That suggests or that indicates how steep the the difference in height is. So it, this is the cliff um, that we saw in the picture. This is if, in Quarry Point. If, I think this is the concrete pad. If you're standing here looking over, you're looking down far at what used to be the quarry. Um, here's Edgecliff Road or Old Quarry Road. Okay, so what is this cement pad? I At this point, if anyone wants to unmute and give it a guess, go for it. Anybody have a guess? You can unmute yourself if you want to. Water tower. Water tower, said somebody. Okay. How about artillery? Something. Um... Yeah, I've heard that one. Dave Robinson is saying radio tower. Radio tower. Okay. Civil defense, I think it was. Civil defense. Okay. So let's think about all those things. Um, so the quarry below needed steam to operate. We know that, right? So um, that goes, uh, that would have made sense if there was a, some sort of water function there. Uh, I also have heard from folks, again, Nancy Knertzer uh, remembers her mother referring to the water tower up there. Um, and my friend, <laughs> my friend Liz met some old guy in the laundromat who insisted that there was a water tower up there that because the water pressure wasn't so good on Highland Avenue. Um, so we, we heard the, the, um, that theory. 
I've seen maps that have the words pipe, tank, standpipe. So, you know, on the maps, there's indications of a water function. And um, I've heard from, um, it was uh, an elderly gentleman who was a trustee with the Cedar Grove Historical Society. He's since passed away, but I believe it was his firsthand recollection that Light 13 um, was located here during World War II. And that was a, I'm going to just read directly from his email to me at the time. The military facility above the old quarry was designated Light 13. It was one of a multitude of high-powered searchlights surrounding the metropolitan area in New York, New York, Patterson. It was part of an anti-aircraft defenses for spotting possible enemy airplanes. So I know Wikipedia says it was a, um, there was a gun there. Um, I mean, other people have sort of remembered that there was a light. Um, no one I have not gotten any definitive proof of anything that was up there other than this man's um, firsthand account of the searchlight and other people remembering a light. Can I, can I say my father told me the same story that that old man did, that okay. it was an overview during the war for viewing, anti, for viewing airplanes come, possibly coming in. Right. And so, and which it makes sense. It's a prime location. And, um, so this, so I'm just, I, the, here's a picture of the quarry with the steam poofing away there. So that's another, you know, sort of um, um, supporting the idea that the quarry needed water. And this, now this was postcard, a man named Steve left this for me at the Montclair History Center one day. And with his phone number, I've never been able to get in touch with him. There was a whole article he gave me um, about the um, Army Signal Corps. So this um, is a big searchlight. And th these, I've seen other pictures of these other things. Those are like big amplification devices. So you would be listening for the airplane and then when then you would look for it with the spotlight. So I believe that these two traveled together um, and, were, and it seems likely um, that they could have been together up at Mills. So the theory, the, I mean, you know, talk to a lot of people. So the, the logical theory seems to be that it probably did begin as a water function up there and then was repurposed in World War II for this um, defense purpose. And what exactly what was up there? I'd love to find out. I, you know, other people have searched and found um, evidence of other radar elements that were used in similar high um, altitude locations elsewhere in New Jersey. Um, but again, no definitive proof that it was here. Now, the other thing in defense of the, or in support of the radar notion is that um, Alan Dumont, who lived right near here, was one of the pioneers in radar technology. And um, so, you know, would that have made sense that there was also some sort of radar function here? You know, maybe, but there's, well, we don't have any proof. But anyways, it seems pretty likely that there was a search light here. So does anybody have any more questions about that before I move on to the next mystery? Okay. Um, so the so the next little mystery of mills. So why are these pillars in the middle of nowhere? Um, if there's you know you're walking along for 20 minutes and then all of a sudden you come to these pillars like you just arrived somewhere. And um, so uh, with the help of Kathy Cole from the Essex County Park Commission, what it appears that actually they they may have anticipated that an entrance from Mountainside Park. So here's Mountainside Park coming up here. Um, like down here would be Highland Avenue, down here would be Laurel Place, you know, that they, it seems that they anticipated more people might have walked up this very steep entrance into Mills Reservation. And there is a path from Mills that comes down into Mountainside Park. Um, and so at the point where you would be entering back into Mills property is where these, approximately where these pillars are. So that's, that's the guess on, on why those pillars are there and what appears to be in the middle of nowhere. Now, what about that bench? If you've ever walked up um, above um, Highland Avenue, above the uh, uh, near the Iris Gardens, you've seen this bench. Um, and I'm sure Nancy has firsthand recollection of this. But um, so this bench is not in Mills, but um, it's in Mountainside Park. And it was dedicated in 1956 to honor Charles Alexander Lex Capron. He sat on the Montclair Planning Board, was heavily involved in community affairs, and uh, by all accounts was quite beloved. So when he died in 1955, a committee was formed to figure out how to honor him. And um, this stone bench was the result. And it was designed by Lloyd 
Barrel, by the way, who was one of the founding members of the Montclair Historical Society in 1964. Um, and this is the inscription because you can't read the inscription anymore. So people are always want to know, but it says this place has been built by the friends of Charles Alexander Capron to commemorate the great talents, the unflagging energy and the generous spirit he brought to a life of service. Sounds like a great guy. And he actually lived right on Bradford Avenue. So I'm sure that he was up here quite a bit. Um, and Lisa Ann Renner and I are always, Lisa Ann Renner is the um, historian for Friends of Anderson Park. She and I do some history presentations together. And um, we are always looking for an Eagle Scout who wants to take on the project of uh, updating or, you know, renovating this bench and the landscaped area around it. So if you know anybody, we can help with some background information. Here's another little weird thing at Mills. What are these pillars on Normal Avenue east of the Mills entrance? Um, so it, it would appear that these um, these pillars predate Mills Reservation. If you look on this 1933 atlas, there is a little road in about that location that goes to the Episcopal Diocese properties. So this isn't a very wide um, driveway or entrance, but maybe in 1933 it was, it was fine. I don't know. But, and then you remember in the 1961 plan, they're still showing what they're calling a gate in that approximate location. So, um, so this could have been even this could have even predated the Episcopal Diocese. And there's other walls and other random pillars up there. So um, the thinking is that Olmsted created the official entrances at Mills to be in context with what already existed on the site. Um, I would love to date the mortar or something to figure out what, date the, what day these pillars, um, what year these pillars were constructed to prove that theory. But that is, that is um, the best guess at the moment. Also up at Mills, we have the Hawk Watch um, and um, the New Jersey or the Montclair Bird Club. Um, I don't know how they're going to, if they're going to do it this year, but um, in the spring, they, they look for the hawk migration, the hawks, they count them um, from the Mills platform. They, you know, right from that cement pad. And then in the fall, they're across the road um, on a piece of property that, um, that the New Jersey Audubon Society actually owns. It was a gift from the Montclair Bird Club. And because this, um, this location is tremendous for, for um, counting birds, it, it, it's the first ridge west of the lower Hudson Valley. And so you get both coastal and ridge flights of birds for people who know about those things. And um, this is the, one of the oldest hawk watching, um, the, we have the, the oldest official fall hawk count. Um, it's been since 1957 from these locations. So they're a very dedicated bunch, the Montclair Bird Club. And the Lenape Trail runs through Mills Reservation. It's, um, it's named the Lenape Trail in honor of the Native American peoples. Um, it, you know, we don't have any evidence of trails actually where in Mills. But um, so the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference in the fall published a comprehensive and updated guide to the Lenape Trail. It, it is uh, tremendous. You can get it on an app on your phone or you can get it from their site. So I would encourage you to check that out. Some people walk all 36 miles in one day. There's like one day a year when really gung-ho people do that or you can break it up into little pieces. So there's a lot to see on the app. And um, we were delighted to be a little bit involved in this project, just helping out. It doesn't go by any of our sites, but um, certainly other important and historic sites. And you know, you, you, um, when you walk the trail, you're looking for the blazes. So like this one's telling you, I think this one's telling you the trail goes to the left, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so check that out if you are a hiker. And also just on the um, Native American people's front, sometimes people ask, what is the evidence of Native Americans in this area? And that's an area that I'd love to dive into more. Some a woman contacted me earlier this week who she is just um, you know, very interested in the Native peoples and has spent a lifetime researching and looking for arrowheads and things. She's actually found what she strongly believes are uh, um, Native American arrowheads up at Mills. And um, although she's not a professional, it's, she spent a lot of time. I've, I'm encouraging her to help us with a little bit more research there. And we'd love to present another article or something about that, which we couldn't do in time for this presentation. Um, Let's see. And there is a Friends of Mills Facebook page. It's not associated with the Montclair Historical Society or with the Essex County Park Commission, but it's um, just an, another resource if you um, love to be up at Mills. 
And that pretty much does it for my presentation. So I will, um, if I can answer anybody's questions, let me know. Helen, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh, yeah, I do. Stop sharing. There we go. Anyone have any questions? Thoughts? Well, hi, it's Thank Mary. You, George Musser. Um, you can hear me, yeah? Yep. Okay, good. Um, you know, everyone is always, we're only here in Montclair three years, but there's so much talk about old Montclair was so much better. It's so much crowded, more, much more crowded and developed. And yet the, it hasn't changed since the 30s. In fact, the population is lower. You said, yeah? Uh, yeah, the, we're at about 39,000 right now because we just qualified for another um, liquor license. Oh. And it was up to whatever, 42,000, yeah. That, uh, but I think the ways it has changed is in the density of the construction, you know, the higher, it, there's different ways you can, you can look at no. that. They're, they're not families with six and eight and 10 kids anymore. Um, so that's probably a whole other development discussion. Right. The, and, and transportation, because I think if transportation were better, people would be using less cars. I just, anyway, but it was, it was, it's striking that, um, and you had mentioned one other, oh, I should have written notes down. When you said, all right, forget it. Um, it, it knowing these little bits just expands on a discussion with anybody, you know, um, uh, um, that's all. I'm going to, I'm muting. <laughs> uh, Helen, somebody else asked, what or where is David's slide? It's, is David's slide? Slide. Like, or devil's slide. I'm sorry. Yeah, my chat box is too small here. Wait, what what's is it? Devil's slide. Oh, devil's slide. Um, I don't know what that is. Sorry. I know there's devil's hole, but that's along the... Um, the walkway, I don't know if it's in Mills, it's along the walkway that is in Cedar Grove, the little bike path there. Yeah, I mean, um, I, some th I didn't grow up in Montclair, so maybe, you know, there might be um, some terms that were used at some point, or, or it could be um, something on the map that is, you know, very detailed that I'm not familiar with. Um, but it, it's, it's so Devil's Slide, I, I can look into it. And here, you got a lot of fascinating thank you, applause, and how old are most of the trees in Mills? Was the land cleared at some point before the reservation was created? Well, I, um, the, it, the land was, it's not an old growth forest. It, um, the land was probably cleared multiple times uh, as people owned plots of land up there. Well, so the, the Montclair or, or Mills Reservation was, was established in the 50s, uh, but you, you know, as people, the, our town was developed in the 1700s, so people needed wood for a lot of things. Um, so it probably those trees were um, cut down prior to that for building, for firewood. Um, and in, if you saw in the photo of the, um, for the Episcopal Diocese Cathedral, I showed a picture of, um, so that would have been from the early 30s and the trees were very small. And that was just what naturally popped up along the reservation. But, um, you know, people do remember in the early 50s, you know, just, there was just people owned before it was became Mills Reservation, people just owned property up there. So someone else questioned, says, I'm from Bloomfield, so I was wondering what happened to the quarries. Can you visit them? Um, well, no, the quarry, no, I mean, I think people have built, oh, well, one interesting thing is like, when you look right over that cliff, when you're at Quarry Point at Mills and you're, and you're like looking down right there where the quarry was, there is a, like a red house down there. It's a contemporary house. And I'm told by a woman who grew up in Montclair in the, um, in the seventies that the person who built that red house was an architect and he designed it around, around a big rock or boulder that may have been a remnant of the quarry. I don't know if it's still there. I always wish that if I saw somebody outside, I could be like, hey, do you have a big rock in your house? But, um, so I have yet to have that experience. 
So uh, they, for well, the most when part, I, when they, I came to Mont, when I came to Montclair, uh, I went to Montclair State, and the parking lot that was called was called the quarry was still an active quarry. Right. You'd be sitting in your classroom at a, a studying, and you'd hear dynamite blasting, you know, in the middle of your lecture. Uh, also, up in, in Clifton, uh, there was a quarry that is now, uh, they built a, a senior housing there, the uh, Four Seasons. They filled, they closed the quarry, uh, sealed up the rock slides, and uh, built lots of houses inside so the quarry. Um, I I um, did a little bit more information on the quarry when um, I was doing a presentation to the kids at Bradford School. So this is like something that was found in one of the quarries. From, um, the rock hunters loved to go up to the quarry that was up by Montclair State before it was developed into Montclair State because you were just like tripping over um, interesting rocks. So because of the way the lava cooled in, um, in, in those areas, you get these like real sparkly, um, I don't actually remember all the parts of this presentation, but it's they. But these rocks were much. Um, see how? Can you see how like how like jagged it is? But so these were rock hounds. Think this is really cool. I and um, so I wasn't prepared to talk about that today, so I don't remember the exact names. But the um, so you used to be able to get trip all around the quarry, and it's been developed, as Mike said. Oops. I. Um, when I was a little girl, my father used to take me up to the quarry, which must have been the Osborne and Marcellus quarry. We would go rock hunting there. Mm -hmm. And when I was a mother of a small child, there was still access, if you were sneaky enough, into the quarries at Montclair State. And so, Jane, my question to you is, would you like a partial dinosaur footprint that I found in the quarry, which is now a parking lot at Montclair State. Sure. It's got history. Sure. <laughs> when, nice. when this is all over, I'll drop that off with a lot of other things. Oh, yay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Uh, we have another question that um, were there houses up there? If so, are there any foundation or traces that you can see? Well, I've always, that's another thing I keep searching for. I think there was a house on Normal Avenue. I think um, somebody even remembers it being like a yellow house with a stone base. And you can see like um, towards Normal Avenue, you can sort of see the remains of um, a foundation or a driveway. And somebody even told me the name of the family and the sons were in the war in World War II. But um, I haven't been able to like through city directory or whatever really find that house but I'm pretty sure it was in Montclair it wasn't in Cedar Grove uh, so those were removed I mean this that's the same thing Anderson Park had houses on it too and when they turned into a park you had to move all the structures off of it so I think there were at least a couple of structures at least one um, that some um, people remember in their lifetime and I haven't I don't have definitive information about it I want to tell you one other quarry story. So on Highland Avenue, I showed you like at first um, in the 1906 map, Highland Avenue just went a couple houses in and Nancy Knertzer's family actually owned the house, the last house on that street. And her mother wrote an article in um, the 70s about growing up there. Um, so they moved in in 1896 and then her mother was whatever, it, you know, five or six years old when they moved in and she remembered, so they were the last house before the quarry, Osborne and Marcellus, and she remembers hearing the, the men would yell um, to when they were gonna um, do a detonation and you had to run and take cover. And sometimes the rocks would come as far as their house, you know, banging on the, um, on the rooftops. And, and she also remembers what she referred to as the old quarry, which would have been further down um, uh, south on the ridge. A, a little human interest story. When I went to Bradford in 1994 to teach, um, we used to take the kids, we pretended we were pioneers and going west, and we would take the kids and walk over and go up through Anderson Park and up right through those um, gates that you showed, Helen. Mm -hmm. and it was hilarious. I used to take them a hundred at a time up the hill, and uh, we would stand on the edge. Of course, they all wanted to stand on the edge and look over. I oh, never. Yeah. Right. 
You would I walk never through lost the anybody. Side park. Yeah, but we went up to the Mills Reservation yes. Park. Some of them would sit on the the uh, plat cement platform, and the rest of them, they were all standing there looking over the edge, of course, and yeah. we never lost anybody, but they, <laughs> they had a wonderful time. Most of them did not know that it was there, and the first principal that I went with didn't have any idea about the hill, and he walked in his uh, penny loafers and a, a sort of a trench coat and his mm -hmm. suit and whatever, and here we were steaming up the hill, and we were pushing some of the kids from behind. It was hilarious. Yes. I love to see Mr. Maloney, who's the gym teacher at Bradford now, or under normal circumstances, um, still take small groups of children up there. Um, I see them regularly um, during the school year doing that. I love that they still do that. Yeah, that's fun. Any other final comments, questions? Thank you, Helen. Thanks, everybody, for Thank you, Helen. our here. Good. Thank you very much. Um, if you know somebody who else might be interested in it, please let them know we're doing a repeat performance tonight at seven o'clock. And uh, next week, Lizanne Renner will be joining us and talking about Anderson Park. Um, she has a deadline on Thursday afternoon. So she's only gonna be on seven o'clock next week. So there will not be a 12 o'clock, there will be a seven o'clock. And as I said, then we hope to line up our May programming by early next week. So hope to see you next week at seven and if not then a week later at whatever we're talking about. So thank you very much for coming everybody. Have a safe and healthy day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks for coming. Thank you, Rowan.